It is beginning to look a lot like Christmas, and we've reached the fourth Sunday of Advent, December the 19th. And I pray God's blessings to be with you as you share with us in our online worship service for today. Once again, we'll be having Advent candle lighting as a part of our worship. And if you can't be with us in person, perhaps you can find four candles that you can use at that point in our worship time together. So you can pause this right now and make sure you have four candles ready to light at that time. They don't have to match. They don't have to be any particular color. That will help you prepare in your home worship, just as we are doing in our sanctuary worship for today. I pray God's blessings to be with you. I'm Pastor Robert Suits from Mount Pleasant United Methodist Church in Roanoke. We invite you to share with us and remind you also that we'll be having Christmas Eve worship services live at 6 p.m. in the sanctuary, and we'll be posting that copy online for you as well. God bless you, and thank you for joining us on this fourth Sunday of Advent.
Today's Advent reading comes from Psalm 34. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. His ears are open to their cries for help. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. He will erase their memory from the earth. The Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. He rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. To be a part of the Jesus story is to remember that he has a special place for those who would otherwise be overlooked. We have lit the candle of the prophets, the candle of Mary, and the candle of the suffering. Today, we light a candle for the shepherds, remembering that they represented those who lived on the margins, those who were easily overlooked. Let us pray. Lord, we pray for the counterparts of those shepherds today, all who are marginalized, dispossessed, vulnerable, hungry for good food, thirsty for clean water, desperate to know they are not forgotten. As we light a candle for the shepherds and for all who are easily overlooked, we join with them in their vigil of hope, waiting for good news of great joy, great joy for all people, for all people. Amen. The question that has been before us in Advent and will continue on through Christmas and Epiphany as we move through the journey of more stories about Jesus. The question, will we identify ourselves as honest and sincere followers of Jesus today? Let us pray. 
Lord, open our hearts and minds to the power of the all-too-familiar stories. Help us to hold on to the songs and scripture verses that we have heard year after year that mean so much. But help us also to listen carefully for the strains of songs that we have missed, for the Bible verses that we somehow overlook, so that we might indeed have the same kind of receptive hearts that John called for so long ago in his time, even as yet in our time as well. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. How good to be together. What a, what a good group. We should have lunch every Sunday, right? I tell you, I know you didn't come just for lunch, but we have been missing a lot of those good dinners at church tables and how important those are. Before I forget, I'll probably say it again, but we are asking people to be sure and wear your mask when you go through the serving line. And there are some extras down there if you don't have one, okay? So we appreciate that. During our Advent series, we have been looking at some of the obvious themes of the season, the things we hear every December. But we've also been looking at some of the overlooked parts of Advent, the songs that sometimes get left out, the Bible verses that somehow maybe we hear them, but we miss them. It's easy to miss the whole story. Now, it is important to cherish the obvious. Sometimes there will be a song that you can sing along almost the whole song without having a book in front of you because the words have become a part of your heart. When we begin to tell that story about the days of Caesar Augustus, when all the world went to be enrolled, those words have become part of us. Wrapping a babe in swaddling clothes, lying the babe in the manger. Cherish the obvious. Hold on to it. Sing those songs that are so dear. But don't miss the overlooked as well. Let's remind ourselves of where we have been. The first week of Advent, we lit the candle of the prophets. And Advent always really begins with the prophets. A good way to think about it is that Advent is like tying together the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. Because we look at the need that took place among Israel as the kingdoms fell and they were in exile and they were bereft of hope, but there were voices like Isaiah and Micah and Amos and others that spoke that basically said, God's not done. There's more yet to come. And so the voices of the prophets are are necessary during the Advent season. And then those help connect to what comes next, the fulfillment of the voice of the prophets in the birth of a baby. When we think about the prophets, we think about the obvious, the dreams back then of people who lived several centuries before Christ who were often empty of hope and not sure where to turn, and yet they heard voices that said, God is still at work. And so when we hear the prophets, we think about what they went through and how that set the stage for the little town of Bethlehem. But there's the overlooked as well, too. Because when we hear the prophets, whether Isaiah or Micah or Amos or John the Baptist, who was the last in the chapter of prophets, when we hear those voices, we need to connect the dots and say, wait a minute, there's a message for 2021 and 2022. There's not just a message for then, there's a message for now as well. There's not just a message for the Middle East, long a land of strife. There's a message for our land of strife as well. Every generation has our own share of emptiness and hurt for which we need to listen hard to the prophets who spoke in the scriptures and to the prophets who cry yet today. That's the hard part. How do you sift through the foolishness and noise of 2021 and hear a voice that God is authentically using to call us 
to the way of Jesus. I probably need to remind you, or maybe I don't, that not every voice that claims to be religious is pointing us in a healthy way. We can e as easily be taken astray by religious voices as we can by those who are obviously atheists or something else. In fact, that may be where we're most vulnerable. When somebody has a Bible in their hand, we tend to think, well, they probably know what they're talking about. Guess what? Not necessarily so. So pray that God will give you discernment to hear the voice that truly comes to us with what we need. Two weeks ago, we talked about Mary. Now there's the obvious. There's gentle Mary. In fact, we sang the song, Gentle Mary laid her child lowly in a manger. We're captured by those beautiful lines that come from Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 is really the chapter of Mary because it tells everything that took place leading up to the birth of Jesus. And it, and it talks about what she went through as, as the angel came to her and began to speak of what she was about to go through. The reassurance that she got from her kinswoman Elizabeth there. We'll, we're familiar with pieces of what Mary went through. We think about gentle Mary in the place where she asked the angel, how can this be? It makes no sense. And then finally said, let it be with me according to your word. We have that picture of gentle Mary who didn't really understand it all, but humbly accepted. What a beautiful picture of what, now we're not Mary, but we are called to listen to God's voice. And sometimes we're called to, think about this. Sometimes we're called to accept what we cannot understand. Has that ever been your prayer? Let it be with me according to your word. I am your servant. Yes, you can make that your prayer. And then we think about Mary's song of praise. We especially remember the first line and the last line of that song that comes <clears throat> later in chapter 1. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. And the passage ends with the words, He helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. That's, that's Mary's great song of praise. But what we miss is the rest of her song. There's more to it. What's the overlooked part? We remember gentle Mary, but we talked about this two weeks ago, that we often forget ferocious Mary. That's words we don't normally put together, do we? Ferocious, we usually think of as being something bad, but did you know you can be ferocious or fierce for something good? Yes, you sure can. When you have an indomitable spirit that, that faces anything that comes knowing that God is with you. We saw that in the mighty warriors of the Old Testament. Oh, yeah. But we see that in Mary, too. Ferocious Mary. One moment she's saying, how can this be? I don't understand. And shortly thereafter, she, she's singing praise to God. Yes, she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. But do you remember what else she said? God has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Minds have noticed that her song sounds a lot like the song of Hannah from the Old Testament, who also was ferocious in seeing the mighty hand of God. This was not the birth of a child that was going to make a nice, sweet, little suburban family. This was a birth of a child that was about knocking over thrones, about turning the world upside down. And ferocious Mary saw it and sang of it. And somehow in our sweet Christmas carols, we sometimes miss that, do we not? 
Yes, gentle Mary laid her child lowly in the manger, but ferocious Mary sang at the top of her lungs with a song that would turn the world upside down. Don't forget ferocious Mary. And then last week, chapter 2 of Matthew, we had the familiar wise man story. And of course, we're going to be circling back to this story, which is really associated with Epiphany, the 12th day of Christmas. There's the obvious of that wonderful story, the gifts from afar. How many times have you seen a children's pageant where you manage to scramble up some royal looking robes and make some crowns. Maybe one of them came from Burger King, whatever, you know, and so you have these kids coming down the aisle, bringing their gifts, and we, we marvel at that story because we think about what that must have been like. Last week I recommended the Nativity story. You can still watch it, even if you don't get to watch it before Christmas. And the story of the wise men is the one of the best parts of that movie. It is frequently funny as you hear them kind of chat about that journey they are, they are taking there. Prestigious visitors from a long way off honoring a baby. It's sort of an ironic scene, isn't it? A very humble birth and very dignified visitors who came a long way. We love that. That's the obvious, gifts from afar. What we overlook in chapter 2 of Matthew, we talked about last week. The terror of King Herod. The terror that came as he was threatened by these folks who were coming to worship. A child who would be king. And Herod took his paranoia out upon the families of Bethlehem. A part of the story that is almost never told. And as we were reminded last week, almost never shows up in a Christmas carol except for the Coventry carol. Luli Lule. A little tiny child that speaks about Herod the king and his raging. So today, the fourth candle, the fourth week of Advent, we think about the shepherds. Now, shepherd images are precious to us in the Bible. The Bible is filled with references to shepherds. I always think of at least three things when I think of shepherds. Of course, I think of Psalm 23, and that probably crossed your mind as well, too. The Lord is my what? I shall not what? We know that that's as much of a heart chapter of the Bible as any. Most of us could not recite a chapter of the Bible. Maybe a verse, but a whole chapter. But Psalm 23, it's right there. I have been with folks who were in the twilight of their earthly life, who could not hold down a conversation. But if you lifted up the words, our Father who art in heaven, or lifted up the words, the Lord is my shepherd, they would speak along. Isn't that amazing? And what a beautiful psalm it is. I think about the shepherd story at the birth of Jesus, of course, like the shepherds today. And I think about Jesus saying, I am the good shepherd. You've seen that picture, haven't you, of Jesus holding the little lamb, and how, how beautiful that is. The shepherds, the obvious is the image of caregiving, that God is like a shepherd to us, and how appropriate that shepherds were there at the birth of the child. Do you ever picture yourself as the little lamb in that picture, where Jesus is holding the little lamb? Just think about the arms of our Savior Jesus holding on to you. When life gets hard, keep that picture somewhere so that you can look at it, and not just look at it, so that you can receive it and internalize it. But, of course, you know it's coming. There's a not-so-obvious part of the story of the shepherds, one which is so easily overlooked. So I'm going to invite you to join with me for a quick little trip to, to Bethlehem where we can learn a little bit more about these shepherds. Bethlehem means house of bread in Hebrew. The town was known for its grain fields running down these slopes. After the harvest, shepherds were welcome to bring their animals into these fields to eat the remaining grain and stubble. In return, the sheep and goats fertilized the fields for the next planting season. 
In first century Judea, being a shepherd was considered a lowly profession. These were the social outcasts. That's what makes this next account in the Gospels so special. News of Jesus' birth came at night to this field or one very near here. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. The birth announcement of Jesus was not made in Jerusalem to King Herod or to the temple high priest. It was made to regular, hardworking shepherds, common men who were having the most amazing evening of their lives were the very first visitors, as was recorded in the Gospel of Luke. And so it was when the angels had gone away from them up into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass that the Lord has revealed to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. The person who would become the most influential person to ever walk on earth had the most incredible birth announcement ever with a heavenly angelic choir. But he arrived as a helpless baby in an animal feed box with common people and animals as his royal court, witnesses to his arrival. It is indeed an odd start to our story, but it's also one of the reasons why the gospel story is so fascinating. All of the mysteries and paradoxes and unexpected twists and turns, they're everywhere. So that's a part of the Christmas story we easily overlook. If you were a mom or dad or grandparent in Bethlehem, I was a little bit surprised to learn that the last thing you would want your little boy to be when he grew up was a shepherd. Anything but that. That was kind of like the last resort. If you can't do anything else, be a shepherd. It was not an occupation looked upon with any amount of of prestige. And when we stop and think about it, the visitors at the manger represent two very different but also very interesting groups of people. Certainly the shepherds who represented the lowly of the locals. And then those who traveled from very far away. Now they were kind of they were kind of special, weren't they? Very learned men who came from afar, but when you say afar, that also means they came from another culture. <laughs> the wise men were outsiders, too. The shepherds were the outsiders of the local village. The wise men were the outsiders who were not part of the faith community. That's who God chose to be there to welcome his son into the world. God clearly chose not VIPs. I don't think he even called the Bethlehem Chamber of Commerce to let them know to be ready. And then that reminds us that we so easily overlook the truth that those who are on the outside in our day and time may be the place where we find the hand of God most powerfully at work. The shepherds often represent the obvious, the caregivers, but we also see that they represent the overlooked or who we might call the marginalized. Now, what does it mean, marginalized? A margin is the very edge. And people who live on the margin, those of us who aren't there, 
we kind of know they're there, but they're, it's like they're out of the picture. And they're often out of our mind. And we kind of go about our merry way and we easily forget about them. I'm going to get a little bit preachy here, but I want you to realize I'm not being preachy at you. I'm being preachy at our culture, which of course does include you and me, but it's nothing personal, okay? Deal? Okay, there's, a, there's a, some phrases we often use in our culture that I don't like. Everybody says them, but I don't like them. Here's one, a two-word phrase, housing project. You've heard that, haven't you? You're driving along in one part of your town, and you say, wow, look at that really cool new condo. And then you're driving along in another part of the town and say, oh my, look at that housing project. Did you know that cool condo is a housing project? What is a housing project? It's a project to build housing, right? I think we could do without those words. We could say, these are apartments, and those are apartments. These are houses, and those are houses. I know we don't mean anything by it, but we could kind of think of a new way because you realize there are code words and code phrases that we use to diminish people. Because we're not insulting the bricks, are we? We're not insulting the floor tile, are we? We're not insulting the window, are we? We're not insulting the street sign. We're insulting people. God's children. Here's another phrase I think we could go a long time without using. Even though we all do it. Bad neighborhood. What is a bad neighborhood? You know, it occurs to me there are no bad neighborhoods. There might be bad neighbors. <laughs> Maybe you've lived with bad neighbors before and they can happen in any hood, right? You know, but when we say bad neighborhood, it's a, it's a way of marginalizing people. It's one thing when people are marginalized. It's another thing when Christians are shoving them to the margin. Shoving them to the margin. And when we look at the circumstances of Jesus' birth in Bethlehem, it occurs to me that if we were looking for the Holy Family here today, we might find them in a housing project or in a dirt road in a holler in Craig County or in a bad neighborhood. The story of the birth of Jesus has so much to teach us and it reminds us that many of us, although we love to decorate our houses and do Christmas baking, we're not careful, we're going to miss Jesus. Because we're looking for love in all the wrong places. Our words make a difference and our way of seeing the world makes a difference. We're used to beautiful pageants and lights and children's pageants with cute little shepherds and cute little wise men and sheep and angels. But today we dare not forget who the shepherds really were. These easily overlooked truths speak to us and help us to hear the whole story of Advent and Christmas. So don't miss the overlooked. Don't forget what the smelly shepherds represented then and represent now. Let's go to God in prayer. Oh God, the faces of the shepherds remind us of your amazing concern for the one who's on the edge, for the one who lives on the margin, for the man, woman, boy, or girl who is facing desperation, for the one whose stomach has been empty so long it's quit growling, for the one who has not much to celebrate this year or any year. Lord, make us not merely gentle Christians. Make us ferocious 
Christians like Mary. Who are willing to see and willing to pay attention to those who so easily get overlooked. God, from the depth of my heart, I thank you and praise you that you still raise up people who pay attention. That you still raise up people that notice things the rest of us miss. That you still raise up people who could live comfortable lives, but who decide instead to take risks and walk down paths that others would avoid and reach out with a hand to those we might not even see. Lord, make us a church family that is equipped for such a time as this. Lord, we are weary as we get ready to face another new year. We've all kind of been beaten down, and so we know what it's like. We're all a little bit marginalized these days. We've forgotten what our center is. As terrible as that is, oh God, perhaps you can do something with that. Oh God, perhaps you can do something with that and make us a better people, a stronger church with more compassionate hearts, with more ability to reach out, with more ability to care for the humble and the victim and the marginalized. All our prayers we lift up to you this day, praying as our Savior taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We began our worship with the John the Baptist medley, and now we're going to do the shepherd's medley. Here are some of the, the beautiful carols we know and love that speak the most about the shepherd.